Thank you. Thank you very much, Arina. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak in the seminar. Thank you all for coming. Um, so everything I'll say today will be based on some uh, joint work in progress with Dimitri Zakara from MIT. And then my goal will be to, in some sense, advertise some of the new Ramsey theoretic problems that appear in the context of the so-called Erdos-Sekeresh problem about finding points in convex position in space. Uh, problems that have uh, various things to do with different sides of extremal combinatorics and theoretical CS. I'm not sure how much I'll get to the theoretical CS, but there, these are topics related to graph regularity, perfect K hash codes, and so on. So uh, let's start. Maybe to, to begin, I'll remind you briefly what, uh, what the ergo Sekeresh problem is. If I give you two parameters, little d and little n, one can ask about the following quantity. What's the smallest number n such that in every configuration of endpoints in RD uh, in general position there exists endpoints the endpoints in convex position. This is a, a classical function uh, introduced by, by uh, Erdos and Sekeres, that's the notation. It's, it's uh, fun to compute even for very small parameters. For example, in the plane, uh, if I take n equals four and ask how many points do I need to get four points in convex position? Well, the answer is five. Um, it's of course uh, easy to see that it cannot be four. You can put four points down like this. So this is uh, approved by picture that this, this function is at least five. And uh, it's also not too difficult to see that five points are always enough. No matter how I place five points in the plane so that no three are collinear, then I always have four points uh, that, that form the vertices of a convex quadrilateral. Uh, and this has uh, various simple proofs. A favorite of mine is uh, comes from this observation that the complete graph on five vertices is not planar. So if, if I put the, uh, the five points down and I draw the straight segments between them, then this is a planar drawing of the complete graph on five vertices. And, and uh, two, two, two edges must intersect internally. The endpoints of those edges must, must be in, in convex position. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this is a proof that this function is at most five, and the two together really quantify this. In general, so a bit uh, in higher dimensions, this, this uh, uh, this journal is as follows. The Erdos-Sekeresh function at d plus two in, in R to the d is equal to d plus three. And uh, here's a, I think, good, uh, good puzzle for this audience. Even though this is simple to prove with different means, uh, what, what's, a, what's a good way, if, if you're interested, to, to extend this, this, this proof using the non-planarity of K5? It's not so trivial, I think. Um, using the K5 argument. Okay, um, so some, some particular values. Uh, in the small chance, uh, you're seeing this for the first time, so, it should not be a priori clear at all that uh, this function uh, is, is a finite quantity to begin with. In other words, that given any two parameters, little n and little d, there is always some, some uh, finite n that, that satisfies this problem. In other words, for sufficiently many points in space, they're always going to be uh, endpoints in convex position. But this is nonetheless true. This was proved rather famously by Erdos and Sekeres in the 30s. Uh, a beautiful paper, quite an important one for the history of uh, extreme combinatorics. It's also Erdos's first paper in, in combinatorics. He wrote some other number theory papers, but this was the first in, in combinatorics that he wrote. It's a paper where uh, Erdos and Sekeres uh, realized that this, this, this uh, geometric function is dominated from above by a more combinatorial 
function, the so-called diagonal Ramsey number for d plus two in a form hypergraphs and parameters and then d plus three. And this d plus three here is the same d plus three as in the previous slide. Uh, and this this quantity is the finite number from 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 the so-called Ramsey theory. So this was this was a very early connection between between these two rather different different worlds and and, and kind of represented an invitation to study. Uh, Hypergraph Ramsey numbers alongside with the arithmetic development. So around Schur's theorem van der Verden and, and, and so on in additive combinatorics and what became known as additive combinatorics later, this, this was uh, the, the other main motivation for, for understanding Ramsey numbers. Uh, okay, so uh, a natural question that arises immediately uh, is, well, okay, how good of an estimate this is quantitatively for this elder sekerish function? How, how many points do we actually need in space to get endpoints in context position from, from this argument? So uh, the short answer is that this doesn't really pro provide very good quantitative bound. Just to give you a flavor, I won't dwell too much. Uh, so in the plane, this 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 uh, this Ramsey function for four uniform hypergraphs is upper bounded by a doubly exponential, something like this, and is lower bounded by something like this. So a function that grows faster than any exponential in a power of n. So these are uh, rather recent results. By and Suk, and this is a result by Hong on Fox and Sudakov. Oh, Fox. Um, so if, uh, so to speak, what this many numbers. Are, this many points in, in, in the plane are enough to always find endpoints in convex positions. Uh, of course, this is kind of a gross estimate. And, and uh, even though these bounds were not available at the time, Erdos and Sekeresh felt this themselves. So on the other hand, uh, in the plane, uh, it's not too difficult to construct exponentially many points, uh, such that there's no convex subset on n vertices. In other words, this erdos sekerich function is lower bounded uh, by root two to the power n. So an exponential, an exponential in n. Uh, what, is, what is really the, the idea? It's really from the picture uh, from before you start with four points. They're not in convex position. And then uh, the trick is to, uh, well, okay. Uh, to generically double this picture slightly. So in, pick a generic direction and double the configuration in that direction using a short vector, shorter than any other side. When you do this, you get the picture with eight points. And uh, it's not too difficult to check that you don't have any convex hexagon in this picture. And you keep doing this. Uh, you can double the picture, pick a new di generic direction, double the picture slightly in that direction. You get then 16 points and then also not difficult to check, you don't have eight in convex position. Always the size of the largest convex subset does not increase by more than two. And every time you double the configuration. So this is uh, this leads to this lower bound. Okay. Uh, so, um, Erdogan's felt that this is much, much closer than uh, in the previous estimate to the truth. Uh, so in the same paper, actually, uh, they, they provided an improved, uh, an improved bound. So uh, they show that the Erdos-Sekeresh function in the plane is at most um, another function, which I'll denote by this. Uh, what is this? So I'll define it in, with two parameters, A and B, asymmetrically. This is the smallest n so that in every configuration of endpoints in R2, in general position, um, there exists uh, either 
A points in convex position that look like this. Call an A cup. Or B points in convex position that look like this. It's called the B cap. So what are these objects? As I said, the left one is a set of, point, set of A points in convex position, where if you order the points from left to right, the slopes of the consecutive segments that you see are increasing. Or equivalently, if you draw the line passing through two, uh, two consecutive points, the picture lies above. And uh, for a B cap, the slopes are decreasing from left to right. And, and the picture lies below any line passing through two consecutive vertices. Okay, so from, from the way I define, this is a complete trivial inequality, of course, if you, if you start with this many points, f of n, n points in the plane, and you find either one of, either an n cup or an n cap, you have n points in convex position, this has no content, but perhaps amazingly, um, it is possible to precisely determine what this function is, not just upper bound, I can completely understand. Well, this function is, it's, 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 it's a number that's uh, exponential in n. Uh, it's a central binomial coefficient, this 2n minus 4, choose n minus 2, plus, shifted by 1, which is uh, roughly 4 to the n, uh, ignoring, ignoring lower order terms and constants. Um, also, notice that implicitly, this equality uh, comes with, uh, with, with a better construction uh, on its own. So, um, for example, uh, Another trivial observation is that this Erdos-Sekerich function is lower bounded by this, uh, this function evaluated n over 2 and n over 2, simply because if I have a convex n gun in the plane, always um, the top part will have at least n over 2 vertices, or the bottom part will have at least n over 2 vertices. In other words, any convex n gun contains an n over 2 cup or n over 2 cap. And if you believe in this equality uh, from here, then, um, uh, then this function is another central binomial coefficient, which is roughly two to the n. So there is there is a construction uh, that does better better than the doubling construction. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this 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 uh, as I said, this was from the original paper and uh, it posed this tantalizing question of understanding the what what how many uh, not, not 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 only how many points are needed in, in the plane to to ensure m points in convex position so the the original question but even the uh, the tantalizing problem of removing this plus one so in other words showing that if you just start with two n minus four choose n minus two points without the plus one there is always uh, configuration of n points in convex position so you in order to in order to be able to show this you would have to somehow go around uh, this this argument of using using this this function. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, there's been a lot of progress on this, and uh, nowadays um, this function is understood quite well. It started with removing this plus one by Chung and Graham. Uh, this was actually it took 50 or 60 years after the original ergo paper just to remove the plus one. And then uh, the, the, the doors open to, to uh, new ideas and, and, and improvements. And this all culminated with, with a really nice paper by Andrew Suk, 2016, um, where he showed that this ergo function is, uh, is on the order of two to the n plus some sublinear term in the exponent. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, and this maybe I should say that uh, this got uh, a bit optimized, so it better. Homsen, Mojarad. Kardosh. So optimized uh, Suk's argument and uh, generalized it also uh, and should argue that this little o of n in the exponent can be taken to be root n roughly. So root n up to some log. Um, so this is essentially the state of the art in the plane. 
In higher dimensions, uh, story is a bit uh, twisted. Um, first of all, um, First of all, this estimate that I wrote in the previous slide, I'll write it again. It's perhaps worth pausing for a moment and appreciating that this gets worse and worse with the dimension. So, um, wait a bit here. As the dimension increases, the size the, the 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 uniformity of the uh, the corresponding Ramsey number on the right hand side also increases and bounds for higher uniformity Ramsey numbers get worse and worse as you increase the uniformity uh, of, of the problem. However, uh, so so it's 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 a uh, it's it's a worse estimate. I won't bother to write down precisely what's known about this. Just to give you a sense, this is kind of like a tower type function. So it's a, it's a tower of exponentials in n, where the number of exponentials in the tower is linear roughly in D. Uh, so it, it's of that order. So it's really a really large number, but it's a fine number nonetheless. The, this, uh, this, this number exists. Um, so okay, the, the question of improving this uh, is perhaps even more meaningful. Uh, so how, how can one uh, do something? Uh, there's also no cap cap immediate way to, to generalize the cap cap lemma. Uh, so I, I should mention in a second that this has the name cap cap lemma. I'll, I'll maybe state it in a moment. Um, Okay, but uh, there's something else. So there's, uh, there's a very simple projection argument that seems to defy this higher uniformity aspect of the problem. On the other hand, uh, if you regard this as a function in D, this is decreasing. So, if you give me as many points, in, uh, if you give me in space two to the n points, as many as you need in the plane to find n points in convex position, you can find n points in convex position in r to the d. The proof is very easy. So what is the, the, the main idea? Uh, it's a picture like this. I draw a bunch of points. Let's say I draw this many points in R3. Take some generic plane below somewhere. And then project everything to this plane. Look at all the projections. There are this many. Among that many, you can find points in convex position. Lift them back up. They will be in convex position in, uh, in space. Um, okay, so uh, it's, uh, it's sensible to believe that uh, that perhaps maybe this this number is smaller. Uh, however, given the first the first part of the story, this this higher uniformity aspect, it's been it's been rather uh, unclear what to expect on this higher dimensional Erdős-Szekeres uh, function as well. But there was some recent progress. I won't uh, maybe I'll I'll write it here. Put a new slide. So we joined work with, uh, with Dimitri uh, last year. We showed that this, this function in space is actually uh, significantly smaller than the function in, play, in the plane. So for all d at least three, uh, it's enough to consider sub-exponentially many points in order to find endpoints in convex position. So this is for all d at least three. Here in our argument, uh, the little o can be chosen to be something like n divided by three times iterated log, just to give you a sense. Um, okay, so uh, 
Yeah, my goal today was not to tell you about this result. Uh, I've given some talks about it, and I think the proof is online <laughs> in several videos. <laughs> so I dug myself out of giving the, the same talk. Uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about is, is uh, this cap cap lemma. Uh, because in some sense, it's really the, the star of the show in all these developments for the erdos takerish problem. It's really behind the driving force behind the arguments in R2 and also in higher dimensions. So uh, let me state it a bit in more general. In, in, uh, so uh, maybe, I, oh, I already defined the function with two parameters. So what is the cup-cap lemma? It's this more, uh, more general equality uh, that the Erdos and Stekerich develop. So this this uh, uh, this this uh, this function from before the smallest answer is that in every configuration of n points in general position you have either an a cup or a b cap. This function, more generally, is equal with this uh, central binomial coefficient shifted by one. So um, a few words about the proof. It deserves it. Uh, what is the main idea in the original argument? I'll tell you two, two different perspectives. The main idea is that, well, if I give you an A cup, so let's say this is a, an A cup, and it ends with this point here, that I'll uh, single out, I'll distinguish. Now I give you a B cap that starts with this point. Okay. No three points are collinear, you should be careful. B cap. Then, well, okay, slopes increase you know, for uh, from left to right in this A cup, all the way up to here, right? Increase, increase, all the way up to the blue point. And then they start decreasing in the B cap, starting from here. So it decrease from left to right. However, as you see, there's some. Um, some lack of tension here. I didn't tell you how the slopes change when you pass from the cup to the cap. Okay, so depend, this could go either way. There's no information about this, but regardless, regardless of how, how, uh, how the ordering, notice that you can always extend one of the two objects. So in this picture, you see that once the cup ends at the blue point, uh, the slopes do not continue to increase. They just drop here with the first, uh, with, with the first segment of, of the cap, in which case you can extend the cap by one. If the inequality would have been the other way around, uh, you would have been able to extend the cup. Okay, so this is a very, very simple uh, observation. Uh, it's not too difficult to see that this, these two are recursive inequality for this, this function. So this, 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 uh, this cup cap function is upper bounded by the sum of the two lower complexity functions shifted by one in the other side here. This is not completely immediate, but uh, uh, an argument is possible in the same spirit as the argument used to upper bound diagonal Ramsey numbers. In fact, that argument originates from the same paper, the, 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 the one we uh, you'll learn in, in introductory combinatorial courses. And uh, again, here is this extra twist that in fact, this, this, uh, this inequality also holds with equality. So for every pair A, B, it's possible to match this with, with, with the construction. If I give you a construction for A minus one and B and uh, for A and B minus one, it's possible to put those constructions together to get the construction of a set of points without an A cap or a B cap. So uh, you, 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 can, uh, you can put the equality holds here and uh, inductively uh, you, you, um, you, get the, you get the construction uh, of this size uh, by putting all these pieces together. Okay, uh, what is the point of this? So it's rather, it feels a bit quite geometric, but uh, perhaps not so much. So the driving force behind this argument 
is uh, the following transitivity property. So if I give you, uh, I don't know, four points ordered from left to right, let's say X, Y, Z, W. And uh, I tell you that the first three form a cup and the last three form a cup. Then, well, the whole thing is a cup. The, four, the full set of four points is a cup. In particular, you also have that the intermediate triples form a cup. So X, Y, W and uh, X, Z, W are also cups. And it's the same if I replace cups with caps. Okay, so this is rather trivial. Uh, if you have a picture like this, the first three form a cup and the last three form a cup, the whole four points form a cup. So it's implicit, uh, it's some kind of transitivity property of cups. And this kind of suggests possible generalization. So one, one uh, nice generalization um, studied by uh, several authors, originating with, I think, uh, Elias and Matusek, if not earlier. Uh, so you, you can ask, okay, suppose I give you uh, a coloring of the numbers from one up to n. So label the, number, the points from in, in, in the plane with numbers from one up to n and color triples in one up to n exactly with this property. So color them red and blue, such that whenever you have four points, four, four, four numbers in one up to n, if the first uh, triple and the last triple get color red, then the intermediate triples get color red and same for blue. So you can define a cap cap function like this. And uh, turns out the answer, uh, it's also dominated by a similar central binomial coefficient. <clears throat> um, another, uh, another generalization, I'll just, uh, just maybe state asymmetrically this time. For one parameter, g of n, you can ask about smallest n such that in every configuration, in, e in every, uh, let's say, two coloring, red, blue, of uh, the pairs of numbers from one up to n. I'm oh, sorry, not pairs, let's do triples still. Triples of numbers from one up to n. Uh, there exists. A monochromatic monotone path of length n. So what is this? Uh, this is the following structure: n plus two vertices ordered from left to right, such that the corresponding triples. X1, X2, X3, X2, X3, X1, oh, X2, X3, X4, sorry. All the way up to Xn, Xn plus one, Xn plus two. All these triples get, get the same color. <clears throat> this is another abstract generalization of this. Of course, uh, it's not difficult to see. This function is related with the cap cap function. So, for instance, the uh, cap cap function at n plus 2 and n plus 2 is dominated by this, uh, this g of n. The n plus 2 is because, well, uh, a monotone path of length n has n plus 2 vertices rather than n. The length is the number of edges of this monotone path, not the number of vertices. This inequality is just because in, if you want to upper, you know, to uh, uh, to upper bound this cup cap function, well, you can just color triples again, red, blue, based on whether they're cups and caps. <clears throat> uh, and uh, a monotone path of length n just corresponds to a cup or a cap. Uh, I want to emphasize though that this is somewhat stronger uh, ask from uh, the coloring. So it's, it's, it doesn't come with the transitivity proper. So it's, uh, There's no further assumption on the two color, color the triples red and blue. So uh, here's, uh, here's uh, a claim. 
rather a theorem. I forget uh, the source of this maybe, but uh, maybe that. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll just, okay. Maybe I'll just uh, stick like this. This this more combinatorial function is also upper bounded by by the central binomial coefficient. So this this is an equality that implies the previous inequality. I want to tell you a proof. So uh, I want to tell you a proof uh, by they learned from a very beautiful paper of Moshkovitz and Shapira. Uh, so implicitly, it also gives you a different proof of the the cup cap lemma. Uh, and it will be relevant for what I'm about to say today. So it's possible to prove this without using this recursive inequality observation. <clears throat> um, so alternative uh, take cap cap. So let uh, I give you some n such that uh, uh, there exists. Uh, to coloring uh, the triples one up to n with no monotone path of length n um and we want to show as monochromatic. I want to show that this n is uh, upper bounded by this binomial coefficient. <clears throat> okay, so here's something that one can do uh, for every. So this is. Uh, This argument is due to Moshkovitz and Shapira. Uh, I'm afraid I don't remember if the, the, the generalization is due to them. It might be due to, due to Elias and Matusek from before. Um, so for every uh, pair of numbers uh, from one up to n, u and v, uh, define the following point. Where these numbers n1 and n2 are as follows. n1 is the size of the longest monotone path that uh, ends with uv in color one. Oh. It ends with you and uh, sorry, it ends with UV and it's color one, <clears throat> color number one. And N2 is the same, but with color number two, size of the longest monotone pad that ends with U, the pair UV in color number two. And uh, okay, notice, of course, that uh, if I give you two numbers, U and V, you might not necessarily have. Uh, a monotone pad that ends with uv in color red. So for instance, if these numbers uv are one and two, the first numbers there, you cannot really have something like this with, with red there. So this, these numbers can be zero. That's why I add one to them here in each coordinate. I would like the coordinates to start from one. And I also know that these numbers are never n because I'm assuming there's no monotone path uh, of length n in, in my two coloring. Okay, so by design, this, um, this point is a point in this box and squared. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so uh, what's the observation? <clears throat> Main idea. Consider the following injective function. Uh, 
for every uh, number one up to big N, I associate a set B of V uh, defined as follows. We look at all the points uh, in this box and squared where X uh, is dominated from above in the standard poset of n squared by the point uv or some point puv where u is less than b. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what does this so domination mean? It means that if I look at the coordinates of x and I look at the coordinates of my point p, uh, the cor each coordinate of x is at most the corresponding coordinate of p. So this is a standard poset in this in this two-dimensional box. So I, 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 I associate the set. The, as the notation suggests, it's kind of a special set. It's a down set. So here's a quick picture. And if I give you a point x that's in duv, everything below x in the, in the post set is also in, uh, in duv just because the same, the, any point in this region is also dominated by the, the same puv that dominates x. So it must be it must be uh, must be a downset. Um, okay, and then well, the main observation there is that uh, this is also injected. <clears throat> so uh, these assignments of sets for the numbers from one up to n these are these are these are all different. Uh, so, so this deserves a quick quick argument. So if you have uh, an equality between two downsets for u less than b, well, what happens? Uh, the point PUV is by design in DV, right? PUV dominates itself in, in the posets. Trivially, it's contained here. Okay, but you, if you have this equality, it means that PUV is also in DU. So by definition, this uh, point must be dominated by some point of the form PWU or W less than U. In other words, I have a picture like this. I have some W, I have some U, I have some V. And uh, there's this coordinate-wise relation between the corresponding things. <clears throat> um, and if you remember what, what the point PUV meant, so it, it, the, its coordinates capture the size of the longest monotone paths in colors one and two respectively, ending at that pair UV. Well, it's easy to see that we cannot really have this relation at all uh, if, if the picture looks like this. So whatever, whatever, color this triple gets, let's say it's red. Let's say it's this, this color red. And red is color number one. So whatever, and the same would, would argument will go for blue. So whatever whatever we have this, this, uh, this triple colored in one of the colors, notice that the, in that coordinate corresponding to that color, this relation cannot hold because whatever path I give you that ends with W U, whatever path I give you here, oh, sorry. Whatever path I give you here that uh, that ends with W U and it's in color one, uh, so it's fully color red. Maybe I should have done it with red. And you can extend it by an extra edge by the, this last edge. And you get a longer path in color red ending at UV. Okay, I'm messing this up. Sorry for the pictures. So whatever red path you have that ends at WU, you can extend by this edge WUV. And so you get a longer path in color one ending at UV, which means that in that coordinate, this inequality should go in the other direction. So this is this is just impossible in color red. 
So this map is injective. And then uh, you are done because uh, the number of downsets is to be box. Well, it's uh, also equal to the number of anti chains in the box. In the, in the post, in the post set. And it's equal with this, uh, this central binomial coefficient, which is a more, uh, in some sense, a very satisfying kind of explanation why this, this uh, binomial coefficient appears to begin with in, in this uh, Erdos-Tekeres argument for both this, this, uh, this function having to do with convex sets and also for the MZ function. So it's, it's really coming from the number of downsets or anti-chains in, in the standard box, also equal to the number of line partitions uh, with, with entries in, in, uh, in the interval from, from zero to N. Um, and then this proof really generalizes uh, very well. Um, okay. Uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm at the space, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, won't have much time to get to, get to what I want to say, but uh, very briefly, how, how are these abstract versions of the cap cap useful for the Sekeresh? Um, so what's the, what's the main idea in, in, uh, in, in the plane? So, um, how are these useful? In R2, well, um, Suk had this idea to use the following structure result. You to uh, Poor and Walter, building on previous work of Barani and Walter called uh, Positive Erdos Sekeresh. So, what is this? Uh, if I give you a number k, at least three, and x, a set of points in the plane in general position. Such that x is fairly large in terms of k, so some exponential. Um, then uh, there, well, as soon as x is that large, it definitely contains, uh, as soon as it at least four to the k, it definitely contains convex k gons. Um, So there exist k points in convex position, but uh, it turns out they also cluster very well. So there is a special k gon such that in every uh, triangular region that you obtain by extending the sides, on every region like this, you get the positive fraction of the points in X. For each triangular region. Contains uh, at least X divided by to the 40 times K points in here. So this is perhaps not the, the quantitative theorem uh, it's a bit surprising, but perhaps it shouldn't be a surprise that once you have so many points in the plane, you get many convex k gons because uh, once you have one, if you're exceeding the threshold, you have by standard arguments, you have many, but what the surprising part is that they cluster so well. And, uh, and uh, in particular, every point you pick in each triangular region, so these transversals, if you pick one point per triangular region, the transversal forms convex k gons. So there's this nice, clustering about the special polygon P. With something like this in mind, well, these abstract versions of cap cap are very useful because if you want to prove, for instance, that two to the n points in the plane are enough to find n in convex position. So let's say you start with uh, um, you start with a set X that has roughly size two to the n. Okay, then you can apply this with K being a polynomial in N. So not, not, not N, but you know, let's say root N or something like that. Okay, you, you can find this structure. <clears throat> and now, well, these, this cap cap lemma and these generalizations are very good at finding um, cups and caps. Well, not of size N, because you don't have uh, four to the N points, but cups and caps of size N over two. 
or rather combinatorial generalizations of cups and caps of size n over two. So by cup cap lemma, you can try to find things that look like this. Perhaps you find two uh, triangular regions that are consecutive and you find a cup like thing pointing at this, this, uh, this vertex of P. And you also have a cup like thing in the neck in the in the triangular section above, also looking at the same same vertex of P. And now, if these have size n over two and over two, then you can hope to merge them together and you get the size a convex set of size n. This might not happen. You may not have find two consecutive regions that with with, uh, with two caps looking at each other, two appropriate generalized caps looking at each other. Um, but well, uh, in this case, maybe you can find um, shire cups in each of these sections that don't look at each other, but they're at the floor. And then you can hope to maybe merge together bits and pieces from each of them. Things that look at the floor seem friendlier to, for gluing. That's really the main idea. With this in mind, you can finish the proof and have a page. Um, in R3, things are a bit more complicated uh, when trying to extend this. Um, but uh, a very natural question arises when trying to just naively generalize this, this, this approach. So how would you go about extending this, this kind of strategy? Well, first, you would need um, some kind of structural result like this in R3, where the numbers, well, this would have to be something that is not the power of two to the k, but a power of the erdos sekerich function at k. So something like this. You have points in R3, and uh, you want a special polytope such that in all the simplicial regions that you obtain, you have positive fraction of the points. That is possible. And then uh, you'd like to find cap-like cap things in each of these sections and glue them together. Uh, the tool that, that seems to be needed for something like this uh, is the following kind of uh, coloring problem. So uh, suppose I give you, so do a definition, definition, or I don't know, that's the question. What is the smallest n? Such that in every three coloring, of uh, the triples from one up to n, there exists a monotone path of length little n, which avoids at least one of the colors. So let's call this function um, something. Let's call this L of little n. So it's a parameter, it's a function of one parameter, little n. And uh, uh, so it's how, how, how large of an interval you need so that no matter how you three, three, uh, three color the, the triples, uh, instead of two color the triples, I have a monotone path. Now the monotone path, I'm not asking it for it to be monochromatic. I want it to just avoid it, at least one of the colors. So uh, um, I, I won't discuss maybe how, how this is a natural kind of function to consider. It, it's in the spirit of uh, this, this kind of strategy. The strategy does not work. One needs to do other things. I won't really tell, tell you about that. But I do want to tell you about this question because I think it's very interesting. It's connected with different things. So uh, as, as much as I can. Trivially, let me tell you something. So what is, uh, what is something that you can, you can say immediately? This function is definitely upper bounded by the, uh, the previous function. If you just pretend that two colors are the same. So among these three colors, let's say you cannot distinguish between uh, red and green. Uh, and uh, okay, then proceed as if those two colors are the same. And then you find a monochromatic monotone path of length n, if, you, if, you, if n is of, of this order. 
Well, okay, then if you unwind what this means in, in the terms of the original three colors, well, it's a monotone path of length n, which avoids at least one of the colors. So this is a trivial bound. And uh, I remind you, this is this, um, this uh, uh, central binomial coefficient. So for a while, we were really wondering, can one do better? And it seems like it's it's kind of kind of hard uh, to do this. The answer is yes, one can do better. But before I state the theorem, let me convince you maybe why why something like this is not really easy. Uh, in a few words, it's, it's not um, not easy because also in, already in uniformity two, this is not a simple question. So let's let's drop the uniformity uh, a little bit. So what would be uniformity two? Uh, so L two of n, the same definition. I'll just copy it basically. Okay. Do some. The smallest tensor is that in every three coloring. But now not the triples of one up to n, but the pairs. You have a monotone path of length n, which avoids at least one of the colors. Okay. So now monotone path means what you think it means, right? So it's a, a sequence of n plus one vertices, x1 up to xn plus one in that order, and the consecutive pairs. Uh, uh, of, you know, they get colors in a way that one color is definitely not represented in this. This monotone path of length n. Does that does that make sense? The, the definition. <clears throat> of course, you can define the same thing uh, for G. G two of n. Okay, I can maybe do the same. I can two color the pairs of numbers from one up to n and ask for a monochromatic monotone path of length n, just path again between pairs. So these are, this is also a classical function. It generalizes the Erdos-Tekerish lemma about increasing and decreasing subsequences in sequences of numbers. <clears throat> okay. You also have the trivial inequality here between uh, the two uniform. Okay, and this is something like uh, n minus one square plus one. It's not very difficult to see this. It's like this. It's also a mild generalization of that, that lemma and, and the proof essentially of that lemma applies to the function G2 of n. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because this problem was actually considered before. Uh, so um, it's a nice theorem. It was considered by, uh, by law. It's a nice theorem of law from around 2010 or so that uh, indeed it's possible to improve on this trivial estimate, but it's, uh, it's pretty hard. So uh, what law showed was that this is indeed little o of n squared. And the proof uses the triangle removal lemma. I will tell you uh, kind of why this is. Uh, so what's what's uh, what's an equivalent version? Equivalently, this problem asks for the following. Uh, so L two of n. This asks for um, 
size of largest possible sequence of points, let's say x1 all the way up to xn. These are points in the cube, n cube. So there's 3D grid such that for every i less than j, whenever a point be, become, be, uh, appears in this list before another point, um, xi has two coordinates where it's strictly dominated by the point xj. So this is what this, this means. xj has two coordinates where it strictly dominates xi. Uh, so this is, seems like a very, very, uh, very uh, simple question, but uh, but there's not as hard. The equivalence I won't mention. It's an equivalence in the spirit of this uh, the second proof I sketched. Uh, so uh, you assume uh, it's 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 kind of the 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 Erdős-Szekeres er proof for the increasing decreasing lemma in disguise. Okay, uh, and, uh, and and really the 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 result. Low is that for this this uh, for this question, you can bound n by uh, little o of n squared. Of course, it's easier to see here perhaps that n squared is trivial. You cannot really have a sequence longer than n squared uh, with this property because after you write down n squared vectors in this list, you're definitely going to have two of them that have coincide in two coordinates just by pigeonhole principle. So that, that n squared is trivial and and uh, and um, just beating it requires a triangular removal lemma. It's a nice question. Uh, then Gowers and Long kind of un unwinded this, uh, this triangle removal lemma argument and, 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 and show that, well, it's possible to maybe use a bit of the proof of the triangle removal lemma and kind of an asymmetrization in the style of Erdos and Sekeresh lemma. So some kind of, you can write an asymmetric version of this for, boxes that have different lengths, combine these kind of recursive inequality perspectives and the proof of triangle removal. The proof is it's more complicated, so I'm just kind of throwing some, some buzzwords that appear in there. It's possible to show that there is indeed a really tiny constant uh, that um, uh, a tiny constant C such that this N is upper bound by N to the two minus C. So this constant is uh, the inverse of a big tower of exponentials. So it's a, it's a really, really uh, infinitesimal thing. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful conjecture that I wanted to, to share with you in case you're not, uh, not familiar with it already. Uh, it's a conjecture, I think, by all these authors. Uh, I think it's quite beautiful that uh, perhaps n to the three halves is correct. It's also not, not difficult to, to see that uh, this is sharp. There is a matching construction of a sequence of length n to the three halves that, uh, that has this property. It's, it's a nice, I, I think, second puzzle to, to, to try to, uh, to see. Um, okay, so in, in light of this, we were a bit scared uh, that the, the three uniform problem is probably also very hard. Uh, it, and, and even, even maybe to beat, to be the trivial bound, uh, from here, the, so just beating this uh, central binomial coefficient estimate. Um, but there's a, there's a, you can see something interesting. It turns out this function L of n, so in uniformity three, back to back to uniformity three, I'll just emphasize here that this is the statement about coloring triples of the numbers from one up to n. Remember the condition is that the coloring is such that uh, there's no monotone path of length little n avoiding uh, avoiding one color. And so it's possible to bound this by a polynomial in n. All right here, uh, a concrete, concrete exponent, into the nine. We don't know if this is sharp or not, but it's a polynomial and then um, somewhat dramatically better than this, this, um, this exponential. I'll tell you the sketch and maybe mention, uh, I'll end with, uh, with an, uh, some 
one or two related open problems. Hopefully I have time. Uh, I'm not sure. How long do I, can I speak? Am I over time already? Uh, the, well, it's usually up to you. Uh, up to me? You definitely so safely <laughs> have like a, a, a half an hour, definitely even a bit more. Oh, oh perfect. Okay. Oh, this is great. Okay, I, I was really scared that uh, that I'm going. Oh no no no! It's like slow and that I run off the time. No, it's from thirty to ninety minutes up. Like okay, it's beautiful. Okay, speed. I'm sorry in advance if if I take all the time uh, and <sighs> if it's more common to. But okay. uh, this is great, great news. Okay, so I can tell you what the sketch is and and uh, mention these uh, these problems. I think uh, they're quite quite interesting. So uh, what's really the point here? Uh, the first step is to uh, associate downsets in the style of this Moshkovich shapira argument I sketch. So uh, associate downsets um, a la Moshkovich. So let me go back really brief, briefly to what happened there. So in this, this argument uh, from before, where we just bounded this function g of n, we took each number from one up to big N. And uh, so each number little v at the bottom. And we associated. Um, we associate a set, which was this down set. So it was the set of points in the 2D box, points that are dominated by some point P of V. So first you define this point whose coordinates captures, ca captures the, the sizes of the longest monotone paths uh, ending with UV in color one and two respectively. So now you have three colors. So you associate the point with three coordinates. Uh, one for each color. And now each coordinate will be something like this, where now you want to associate a coordinate capturing monotone paths ending at UV, not, not in color one, but avoiding color one. And you know that you don't really have things like that of, of length N in each color. So doing exactly the same operation, I won't spell it out again. Uh, you get a very interesting equivalent problem. Uh, You get a set, a collection of subsets of n cubed, such that for every uh, two numbers, u and v, u less than v in the, in the list, um, the following holds um, there exists. some vector in D sub V such that X strictly dominates D sub U in the sense that um, X in the sense that for every, I'll write it like this, for every Y in D sub U, X is uh, bigger in at least two coordinates than the points than the point Y. Okay, so there is some special special vector in in D sub V such that this vector uh, it's really dominating um, all the vectors in the U in the in the sense used before that X always has at least two coordinates where it's bigger than the corresponding two coordinates of Y for every Y in the U. And the question is, how long of a list can you find like this? How large can um, and possibly be in terms of the length? Notice, by the way, that if these sets are singleton sets, if these are if the sets d1 up to the n, 
are just vectors in, in, the, in the box. These are just 3D vectors. This is really the same condition as here. You have a list of vectors where whenever one appears before another one in, in the list, it has two coordinates where it's strictly less. So if these are singletons, this is the previous problem in uniformity two. So this is the problem you reach after associating down sets. That's, that's the notation. Uh, each of these sets are actually, you can assume they're down sets. It doesn't really help further, but uh, you use that they're down sets to get to, to, get to this reformulation. Okay. Uh, any questions about the statement of this? Uh, maybe, worth, maybe it's worth pausing for, for a moment uh, about this or the previous one. <clears throat> So uh, what's the idea? So the second, the, the, with, with this, this, this problem in mind, uh, now it's possible to construct a second filtration in, the, in, the, in, in, in this Erdosekeresh, Moshko, Shapira style. Uh, so second, second filtration for every um, V in my interval, I'm gonna define another map, another injective map. Well, it's theta prime. So to each uh, V, I'm gonna associate a special subset of the set SV. What is the special subset? This will be a set. Um, So a set such that for every um, for every x and dv, so every vector there has um, some element in S of v such that um, y we well dominates maybe I should say weakly dominates x in at least the coordinate. So I'm looking, I'm, I'm selecting for, for, my, for my set D sub V in there. I, remember, I remind you, this is, a, this is a subset vectors in the 3D grid. Okay. In this subset of vectors, I'm looking for a su special subset S sub V, which is a set of vectors that has this property for every point in D sub V, there is something in, in the subset S of V that weakly dominates X. Weakly dominates this meaning that uh, uh, Y has at least these two coordinates that are at least as large as the two coordinates of X. Not with strict inequality this time. So this, uh, in graph theoretic language, this is called actually a total dominating set in a tournament. So there's an underlying tournament here. What is the tournament? Every two vectors that I pick in the 3D box, well, they must satisfy a relation like this. There must be one that weakly dominates the other one in at least two coordinates. So this implicitly defines, defines a tournament on, on, uh, on the 3D, 3D box. Okay, so between every two, I point an arrow from X X to Y if, if it's dominated, or if, it, if X, uh, I should say the other round. Uh, I point an arrow from Y to X if, uh, if Y dominates X, like uh, in, in this sense. And then with, with this perspective, 
this, this S of V is what's called the total dominating set in this tournament. So now a question arises, well, uh, okay, what, uh, what kind of total, what, what kind of dominating sets can you associate to, um, to V? So how large such things exist? Well, uh, how, can you, how, how can you find total dominating sets in, in, in this corresponding tournament? So it's not too hard to uh, see that with greedy procedure, can find um, S of V of size um, at most log, log base two of N with some constant in front. What is really the point? The point is, well, for if you, you can kind of go like this, right? You, you uh, in this tournament on, on the 3D grid, there will be some point, some, some vector that has, uh, more arrows coming out than coming in. You throw away, so you, you pick such a vertex, you make it part of SOV. Uh, you throw away these guys that, that, uh, that get dominated by X. You look at the rest. You, re you repeat inside there, you find a vertex that, domina that dominates more than half of the rest. Pick that vertex, throw away the other half, and so on. This process ends after roughly log, log n steps, and you can find a total dominating set like that. Uh, this kind of thing is sharp, actually. So if, you, if you, I give you some tournament with no structure, it's just a tournament, and you're trying to find a total dominating set. Uh, log a random tournament achieves which is this log of n. So a random tournament typically will not have dominating sets of size less than log of n. But this, this tournament has some structure. So it's kind of, it's something that's called a majority tournament. It's a tournament where you have like these three linear orders. In this case, they coincide. And you're kind of putting an arrow when a vector dominates another one in at least two of the three linear orders. So it turns out it's possible to use uh, Uh, results about this, in particular, the theorem by uh, Alon, Brightwell, uh, Kirstead, Kostoshka. Kostoshka, there's a, I think Winkler also, many others. It's a really nice paper where uh, they study how large dominating sets and tournaments can be. And uh, it's possible to, in a tournament like this, using their ideas, it's possible to find a set SV of size bounded by a constant. Size SV of size at most three. This. How is this useful? Uh, so the, the main observation, the final punchline is that uh, this map, Then the prime is also injective. Uh, so if you, the claim is the following. If I associate to each vertex and one up to n, some total dominating set, so some, 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 uh, some, some subset S of V and D sub V that, that has this property, I claim that uh, this map is an injection. There's no way. S of U and S of V can be the same set for two different vectors U and V. So if U is less than V and uh, I don't know, let's say S of U equals S of V. Well, okay. Uh, what, um, what can you say? So, by definition, by design, by, by the hypothesis. If U is less than V, there was some condition about the set DU and DV. So there is some special element X in DV such that X dominates the U strictly. So X is this special vector for every element, every vector in DU. 
X has at least two coordinates where it's strictly bigger than the coordinates of Y. Uh, I.e. In particular, X also dominates S of U, right? S of U is just a subset in here. So this is true for every Y in S of U, in particular also true for every Y in D of U. Okay, but if, uh, if this is true, if this S U equals S V, and X dominates strictly S of V, okay? But by definition of S of V, so on the other hand, S of V is this dominating set with respect to D of V. It's total dominating. I.e., uh, well, uh, for every for every x in D of V, there is something in uh, S of V that where you have the inequality. So for every x, I remind you of the definition. There is some y in S of V such that the the thing happens. Like this, <clears throat> y is weakly dominating x in at least two coordinates. So, but in particular, I want to just emphasize that, well, this x we started with was in D of V. In particular, this thing holds for this x too. So you have this relation and you have this relation between uh, some x in D of V and some y in S of V. And it's possible. It's impossible to have this relation at the same time, right? You cannot have x dominating strictly dominating in two coordinates y and being dom weakly dominating in uh, in two coordinates the other way around. So this map is injective it's from this argument, uh, and so uh, this gives a bound. What bound? Well, it gives. It says that n, which is the size of the domain, is at most well the total possible number of options of dominating sets there are. So that's why it makes sense to associate total dominating sets that are as small as possible in order to minimize the size of this codomain. In fact, even with log, notice that this gives a gain over, over the trivial bound, right? This, this alone implies something like, uh, n is at most uh, the binomial coefficient n choose log of n, this, this how many possible sets of size at most log, log of n there are there, and this is better than, than 2n choose n, but with, with, uh, with this is at most. So this is all the sum of the binomial coefficients up to there. And well, with at most three, uh, we get uh, n is at most. Uh, so this is n cubed, I apologize. N cubed is the, the size of the box, and we're looking at subsets of size at most log of n. And that's how many there are. And if you can associate total dominant and sets of constant size at most three, then uh, it's the sum of these uh, binomial coefficients up to n cubed choose three. So this is like uh, n to the nine, at most strictly less than n to the nine power. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the how the proof goes. Um, I want to tell you, uh, I think, a natural question. So you can ask a uh, question like this in, for Ramsey also, so undirected Ramsey. This is really not, uh, not the first people to do this. Uh, in fact, it's a kind of classical problem introduced by Erdos and Semeredi. Um, so can I find the same thing? Let's say R prime of N. You can ask, well, okay, usual Ramsey number is the smallest N such that in every two coloring of the edges of the complete graph on N vertices, you have a monochromatic clique of size little N. 
Well, let's do the color avoiding version of that rather than uh, the monochromatic version. So in, 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 in a sense, let's do for Ramsey what we did for Erdos Sekeres uh, for, for this uh, cap cap problem. So in every three coloring of uh, the edges, case of N, there exists a copy of uh, case of little N, which avoids at least one color. Okay, so trivially again, same story. Um, if you pretend two colors are the same, you can uh, dominate this parameter by the usual diagonal Ramsey number. I'll write it like, okay, I'll write it like this. So this is the diagonal Ramsey number. which we know is uh, something like four to the n. There have been recent improvements and so on. I won't mention it, but uh, it's it's still at most four to the n. It's a big open problem to show that this is at most 3.99 to the n. But the question, can you do better? Uh, and it's possible to adapt the proof of uh, this four to the n bound for MC numbers. I won't spell it out, but you can you can try using this recursive inequality perspective. Uh, so this uh, maybe I should put better between quotation marks. So this is a bound that's of the order of uh, three over two to the three n. So twenty seven over four to the n. So smaller than four to the n. But I put quotes between better because maybe in principle it could be possible that the Ramsey number, the original diagonal Ramsey number, is also lower bounded by something much smaller than than twenty seven over uh, twenty seven over eight. Yeah, of course that that that's a difficult uh, open problem. But th this is this is possible. So uh, follows from a recursive inequality. the form r prime abc is at most a sum of the three lower complexity functions this 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 is an asymmetric version of this function with three parameters this is the variable avoiding color one avoiding color two avoiding color three for b and c so those are the clicks of sizes clicks of size abc that you're forbidding and something like this holds <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, I claim, I won't tell you the full story, I just mentioned maybe the connection. Uh, so this is kind of, this is the same bound. Like, so the, the question is improve on this, this three over two to the three N. Uh, and kind of to convince you that this is maybe a, uh, an interesting question. So improving on um, this in some sense, uh, not so much better than trivial estimate for this function, maybe the new trivial bound for this, uh, is related to improving the rate for perfect three hash codes in, in, uh, in a box uh, with the, in an n-dimensional box with a three-letter alphabet. It's a classical problem in information theory called the so-called reference problem. This is the problem that asks for uh, how large can a set be inside this box, such that for every three uh, elements in A distinct, pairwise distinct, there is a coordinate where they hash. There is a coordinate where there, you just see the number 0, 1, 2 in some order. Yeah. 
these are also called perfect three hash codes. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, the interesting from how large can they be? It's related with the polynomial method also. So you can use algebraic methods to upper bound this. Algebraic methods related with the cap set problem uh, uh, from additive combinatorics. Uh, those methods give something, but uh, kind of the the twist is that the best known bound is the bound of the form uh, three over two to the n, which uh, comes from a simple inductive argument in the style of the erdos sekirash argument with the recursion. Uh, I won't sketch it, but kind of the, the punchline is that this three over two is the same as the three over two uh, from here. Um, so kind of, that's one reason this is interesting. Perhaps another kind of uh, good problem that I wanted to advertise. So I, I see that this question in uniformity to this Ramsey problem. So I three color the edges of the complete graph on invert to see normal complete graph. Which you, and you ask for a copy of K that avoids at least one color. Well, I can do the same uh, thing now, but three uniform hypergraphs. So let me copy this. So working twice. Uh, so I know how to mark now the uniformity three. Maybe I'll just use the, the same, uh, maybe double prime. And now I'm three coloring the edges of not a complete uh, graph, but complete three uniform hypergraph on in vertices. And I'm asking for a copy of the complete three uniform hypergraph on little end vertices that avoids one color. Um, there's a trivial bond if you pretend two colors are the same, of course. This is dominated by the so-called three uniform Ramsey number. So this is the diagonal. Three uniform Ramsey number where we just took color red, blue, the edges of the three uniform hypergraph and you ask for a monochromatic. And uh, well, uh, this is upper bounded by uh, double exponential function. So two to the two to a linear function in N. So for some constants here, this is a classical bound, uh, Erdos, Heinal, and Rado. And it's perhaps the second or the first most famous problem in the, uh, in the graph Ramsey theory. So next to the diagonal Ramsey number for graphs improving on the four to the n, uh, equally famous uh, in some sense, is improving on uh, this, this, uh, this bound for the uniform Ramsey number. So kind of the best known bounds for this uniform Ramsey. Uh, there's a big gap kind of similar to uh, also Edo Seker's story about convexity. So the, 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 the it's, it's not just that, so compared to uniformity two, where we at least know that the answer is exponential, we don't know which exponential it is between root to the n or four to the n. For three uniform, we don't really know the, 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 the order of, of growth at all. So there's this upper bound that I wrote above, and there's a lower bound that's kind of like just an exponential in n squared. Um, and uh, there are conflicting conjectures, I think, here and there, which, which is the truth. I think the most popular belief is that maybe there's a lower bound that matches this upper bound for, for the three uniform MZ. But maybe you can guess now the question. So uh, the question, maybe in light of this result that I told you about in the erdos sekirich world in uniformity three, the color avoiding result about LN. So we saw that the, there is one drop in kind of magnitude, drop in number of exponentials in some sense when you when you go into higher uniformity. There was this trivial bound uh,
that ln is bounded by the central binomial coefficient. So this was the three uniform version of the erdos sekeres coloring problem, erdos sekeres related coloring problem, the color avoiding version. So we saw that this ln is bounded trivially by this, and uh, our result gave a polynomial bound in three uniformity using this layered filtrations. A very natural question would be, well, perhaps, um, is it also possible to see a drop in the number of exponential for the Ramsey version? Is it true that our uh, double prime of n, if it's at most, uh, something closer to the lower bound and I'll put maybe here another constant C prime. I'll just do this. It seems like to me that this, this could be the correct, but <laughs> correct thing to ask, but I, I don't really have any idea to do it. Anyway, I just wanted to advertise some, some questions, I think, uh, related to this. I'll end here. I think I'm out of time. I really used it to, to the fullest extent. Thank you for the, <laughs> the for sticking with me. <clears throat> right here. OK, thank you very much for your great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, actually, I have a, a very stupid question still related like for, to the very beginning of your talk. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about this um, uh, complete graph argument that uh, so that you can that like for the for the yeah, so the, so could you remind this uh, argument? I, I'm not sure I completely understood it. Uh, is it from? Uh, like it's, oh, it's uh, from the very very beginning, like when you were explaining like this uh, uh, function. Um, sure. So that uh, on the plane, in ah. uh, if you take five points, that you will always yes. find four. Yes. Oh, the 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 first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, first yeah. Time. I'm sorry. It was. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this planar non-planarity argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I actually didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I maybe understand. I once. Uh, so I want to argue that given any five points in the plane, they're four in convex position. So I draw the five points, and then I draw straight segments between them. It's some some planar drawing of K five. It's 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 a picture in the plane. But now, given that K five is not planar, two edges must intersect internally somewhere. Now, if I have two straight segments that intersect, the endpoints must be in convex position. Right. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's so. a, it's a strange argument in the sense that it doesn't really generalize in in a, in a clear way to prove. Yeah, yeah. But, but now it makes it a bit more interesting to think like what actually would generalize. Yeah. Okay. I think it has connections with like these uh, maybe things that you probably know much more about uh, here. This uh, this topological Radon versions and. Uh, I guess uh, embed embedding uh, high, you know higher dimensional simplices in in, uh, in R to the D maybe the, it's a uh, this Van Campus Flores kind of abstractions and these things. So I th I think th there is a question here. Maybe okay. Maybe I can ask a, a different. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly how to argue that. Uh, I guess if you embed the simplex on D plus three vertices, you have. Uh, In, in RD, then um, then something happens. So well, there, get, there must be some. Uh, if you take the flows complex, uh, yeah, then it is not embedded, and you can play the same game. So you will have yeah. two faces at intersect. Yeah. 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 So there's a there's a kind of a topological version of this question that also was kind of fantasizing about at some point. Uh, maybe maybe. It's more interesting uh, to this audience. So let's say topology. It's in the plane, but you can ask it in higher dimensions also. So uh, 
you can ask for the smallest n such that in any planar drawing of k sub n, so the complete graph, on invert, look at all the planar drawings, and I want the smallest n such that uh, I always have a copy of k sub n, a smaller complete graph, where every four vertices form a cross. Smallest n so that in every planar drawing, case of the n, uh, there is n vertices. So it's just a copy of case of little n, such that every four vertices among these form a cross. In some sense, it makes sense because uh, this kind of proof with the non planarity of K5 is not an overkill anymore. So, just using the fact that K5 is not planar allows you to, um, to dominate this topological function by this. It's the same argument, but now you actually need the, the planar, non planarity of K5. Uh, and it's a question of okay, uh, you have this bound for the Ramsey number. Can you actually improve it uh, a little bit by doing some more clever? more clever geometry, um, and of course, higher dimensional versions also. Okay, are there any more questions? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case, so I will uh, stop the recording.